Hi, everybody. Uh, so my name is Jeremy Cohen, and I'll be moderating this very special episode of The Jacobin Show today. Um, we are privileged, honored to have with us two of the left's most important thinkers um, to speak uh, on the important question of ideology and culture and what role these things play in the structure of capitalism, in working class organizing, and in left-wing politics today. So first of all, I'm honored to introduce uh, Slavoj Žižek. Um, he's a philosopher, probably people know him, but I'll say, um, he's a philosopher and critic whose work has covered everything from continental philosophy to psychoanalysis to Marxism. Um, he's published over 50 books from his uh, first, The Sublime Object of Ideology, which meant a lot to me in college uh, when it helped cure me of postmodernism, I used to say. Um, and uh, two, I think three recent volumes on the pandemic. Um, and he's also been the subject of a number of films. Uh, Zizek also holds many titles at many universities, including the University of Ljubljana, the University of London, Kyunghee University and New York University. Um, second of all, we're joined by Vivek Chibber, um, actually really the guest of honor today um, in celebration for his new book, The Class Matrix, uh, Social Theory After the Cultural Turn, um, which we'll be discussing. Um, Vivek is the editor of Catalyst Journal and professor of sociology at New York University. Um, he's the author of a number of books, including Locked in Place on uh, and uh, Postcolonial Theory and the Specter of Capital. Um, and again, today we'll be talking about his new work, which uh, asks us to profoundly reconsider the role of ideology in social relations in capitalist society and kind of move past both uh, take in certain arguments from the cultural turn, but also move past them. So briefly, an introduction about the class matrix for those who haven't had a chance to read it yet. Um, you should get it. You should read it. Um, uh, a major focus of Vivek's book is explaining what um, produces stability within capitalist societies. This comes out of the puzzle of why a system that is so racked by conflict has remained in place for several centuries and now rules the globe. Um, if this is, as left-wingers think it is, a world that's organized along unjust and exploitative lines, why is it that rebellions are breaking out sort of everywhere all of the time? Um, a classical sort of answer the left has provided, um, especially, we might say, in the Western Marxist tradition to this question, to the sort of failure of revolutions, even in um, uh, profoundly capitalist societies that seem in so many other ways to fit Marx's picture of where society was going. A classic kind of answer to this question is that culture and ideology, uh, maybe even direct ideological indoctrination um, to the values of the system have helped keep the system in place. Um, Vivek's argument contests that claim and thereby goes against the current of a lot of social theory. So he's going to lay out that argument regarding the role ideology does and does not play in the process of capitalist stability for about 10 minutes. And then Slavoj will get a chance to respond before we open up a larger discus discussion. And I'll throw a few questions in the mix as we go. Let, let me uh, start with uh, the puzzle that, that Jeremy raised, uh, which is the central puzzle that uh, the book tries to deal with, which is how is a system like capitalism, which is at its root, based on domination and exploitation, how is it still around after so many centuries? The classic Marxist tradition addressed this question over and over and over again. Now, at the heart of the Marxist uh, theoretical framework, of course, is an approach called materialism. And materialism has several different dimensions to it, but at the core of it is the idea that people, when they pursue their politics or their economic uh, goals, they are basically guided by what's called their interests. So at the heart of materialism, social materialism is a doctrine that social action is governed by people's material interests. So in the, it, the, the gamut of Marxist history, the assumption was that when you pose a question like how does capitalism remain stable, how do class actors uh, interact with each other and engage the world, there was an assumption that the answer would be a materialist answer. It has something to do with their interests. In the decades after the Second World War, materialism became overshadowed by an approach with 
promoted and emphasized the role of culture and the role of ideology. Because in the post-war left, starting with the early new left, of people like Stuart Hall and E.P. Thompson and Raymond Williams and people around the New Left Review, there was this conviction that Marxists had not taken ideology seriously enough. And so the many of the puzzles for Marxist theory would be answered by looking at ideology. Now, why did they think that? It was because they were motivated by this very question that we're trying to answer today. Why does the system remain stable? The question arose because in the teens and 20s and 30s, it seemed like Marx's prediction that capitalism produces its own grave diggers and they'll overthrow the system. It seemed like that prediction was coming true. But by 1950, it was clear that in the West, you'd entered a period of political and social stability. So how did a system that was supposed to have been overthrown by the exploited class in fact end up remaining stable over time? That was the question that the Western European New Left posed for itself. And the worry that they had was this, that we know that the structure of the system generates conflict, that the structure of the system is built around exploitation. The problem is that that structure is not generating the kind of social action that it was supposed to, which is a social action of the workers organizing themselves and fighting around their interests. So they accepted the description of the class structure. What they were worried about was that the the predictions about the political consequences of the class structure were mistaken. So the puzzle became, could there be an intervening factor between the class structure and political consciousness, political action that disrupts and interrupts the predicted causal flow, the predicted consequences of the structure on action? And the immediate answer was, well, it has to be ideology. It must be culture. Starting with the Frankfurt School all the way into the Gramscians of the 1970s, what held all of them together was this notion that Marxists have overlooked the way in which cultural hegemony, cultural influence, the the media industry affects workers' consciousness. And that was an elevated to an even larger question, which is Marxists have overlooked the role of what's called the superstructure. So if you look at the intellectual history of much of the new left, it is its single most important focus is culture. Its single most important focus is what's called the superstructure, things like that. And it's considered a theoretical advance to focus on that because this is the gaping black hole inside Marxist theory. Okay, so now what I argue in my book is that this is profoundly flawed. And it's profoundly flawed for the following reason. The new left was stuck with this very awkward view that they accepted Marxist description of how workers confront capital and what the experience of labor is in capitalism. They accepted it, which was workers are dominated by their employers. They're exploited by them. They lose their autonomy. Their wages are suppressed. They're treated to horrible working conditions. The, there's a loss of control over their lives outside of the workplace. They accept all this. But then they ask, why doesn't this turn into a political consciousness? And they say it's because workers are essentially socialized by ideology into accepting their place. Now, the difficulty with this view is you have to answer, how is it that the people who are undergoing these experiences somehow are simply by the force of ideology, the force of socialization, taught or persuaded to overlook their exploitation, to overlook their domination and accept their place in the system? Underneath it has to be a view that the workers are dupes or that they're irrational, or that they suffer from cognitive failure. And in my view, this is a deep problem inside the entire framework of the new left. They accept the description of the class structure, but then they refuse to consider the fact that workers might have good reasons not to organize, good reasons not to rebel, good reasons not to come together, and therefore either assume directly or imply that the workers are in some way cognitively deficient. So what I try to do in this book is to say, assume for a second that workers are reasonable, that they have a pretty good understanding of their their surroundings. Could we answer the question of why they don't rebel if we work on these assumptions? And what I provide as an answer 
that the reason capitalism is stabilized in the post-war era is not because workers are fooled by ideology, but because the class structure, in addition to generating a conflict between workers and capitalists, has one more property, which is that it channels that conflict into manageable directions for capital. What work, Marx was right, as was Lenin, as was Luxembourg, in saying that the class structure is built on exploitation and generates conflict between workers and capital. Where they did not sufficiently theorize was that the, chat, the conflict does not have to take the form of collective action. They wrongly assumed that the conflict will take the form of workers coming together. In fact, what the class structure does is because it makes collective action, organizing, making unions so difficult, imposing all these risks and all these costs onto workers, work, workers find it prudent and rational to resist on an individualistic basis rather than take up all the risks of organizing themselves. Organizing, therefore, is not the natural consequence of exploitation and domination. It is an exceptional consequence, and it comes about in very particular circumstances through very particular work. The baseline reality of capitalism is that workers resist through individualistic means, not through collective means. But once you say that they resist individually, they will lose. They resist, but they lose because, they, of course, their employer is the much stronger party. So the secret to capitalism is while it generates conflict, it also underwrites its own stability by channeling that conflict into manageable ends. Ideology, therefore, was wrongly inflated by the new left as the source of stability. The source of stability is the class structure itself. And this is why they have this amazing fact that wherever capitalism has gone, into so many cultures, into so many regions, into so many ideological complexes, collective action has been the exception, not the norm. That means then that it has a way of stabilizing itself wherever it goes. Well, what is the common factor wherever it goes? The class structure. It is a material property of the class structure to generate stability by raising the cost of collective action. This means that the, the fundamental flaw of the new left was this. They, were correct, they correctly understood that the class structure generates antagonism, but they wrongly attributed to ideology the role of stability. The class structure does both. They, the problem with Marx and Lenin was that they didn't sufficiently develop the implications of their own materialism. They knew what I'm saying to be true. You see it implicit in their writings, but they didn't raise it to the level of theory. When the new left encountered this dilemma and tried to raise it to the level of theory, they wrongly reached for ideology. All right, now if it's the case that ideology does not, is not the source of stability, but the source of stability is the economic and material constraints that workers face, is there any role of ideology at all? I say, yes, there are two roles. In the stabilizing dynamic of, of capitalism, ideology plays the role of rationalizing workers and capitalists' actions. So the new left thought ideology becomes the motivating factor. It motivates workers not to rebel. It motivates workers not to organize. In my view, what the motivating factor in stability is the economic and social circumstances and constraints that workers feel. What motivates them is a prudent, rational response to their circumstances. What ideology does is that it helps them live with the choices they've made. They make the choices based on economic and material considerations, but those choices that are then rationalized and understood and interpreted by them through ideology. So ideology is in a way the cement, the glue that fills in the holes where the material constraints of workers are doing the deeper work, the more fundamental work, when it comes to stability. The second role it plays, and this is, I flip the new left and the culturalists on, its, on their head, whereas they thought ideology is important in stabilizing the system, in my view, ideology is important in generating the destabilizing factors which is when workers try to organize themselves and try to create collective organizations, ideology is what enables them 
to undertake the sacrifices, to undertake the risks, to undertake all the heavy lifting they have to do because it generates what we might call a kind of collective identity. That collective identity, what we call solidarity or solidarism, is cannot be brought about simply through risk minimizing or, uh, or benefit maximizing calculations. It's going to require real ideological work. So the role of ideology is not so much that it stabilizes the system. The stabilization comes from the material circumstances of workers. The role of ideology is that it's part of the arsenal of the working class of socialist parties to generate the social political identities that help workers overcome a lot of the obstacles to collective action and help them willingly take up the sacrifices that are inevitable in any collective struggle. Ideology, therefore, has two roles. It is the means through which workers and capitalists rationalize their entrapment within the structure. Capitalists rationalize it as well. They have their own ideological functions, their own ideological uh, uh, justifications for why they brutalize people, why they do what they do. The second role that ideology plays is that it is an essential component of the organizing tools, the organizing kits that socialists and unions have for generating the identities that are essential to class mobilization. So what I'm trying to do in this book is, on the one hand, restore a, the materialism that is essential to Marxist sociology, to Marxist social theory, which says that social formations come and go based on their, the material considerations of the classes, not through ideology per se. Every social formation is rooted in a class structure which is important because of the way it generates class capacities and class interests. So I've restored interests to the core of the, the social theory that Marx has had. But then I don't erase the importance of ideology, I just reassign it. In stability, stabilizing capitalism, it's a secondary factor because it provides rationalizations. In mobilizing workers, it is a crucial factor because it helps generate political identities. So whereas the new left thought ideology stabilizes the system, in my view, ideology is part of the destabilizing package of collective struggles. That's the, in, in, in very con condensed form, that's the theory. Uh, thanks very much. And again, although I am often identified as a, in my style, crazy postmodern guy who includes dirty jokes, jumps here and there, I try not to be, I try to, I often fail, write and talk like Vivek. Because I know that there are many so-called postmodern Marxists, and one of them even gave me the most disgusting pseudo-Hegelian justification of it. I told him, but you are inconsistent. It's not clear what you want to say. You know what was the answer I got? This inconsistency is in reality itself. So precisely through being inconsistent and self-contradictory, I give the adequate image of reality, blah, blah, blah. So let me just improvise a couple of points. You, Vivek, wonderfully pointed out how the great classics, uh, Marx, Lenin, and so on, uh, it's not simply that they didn't see what you, Vivek, were saying about in their political practice, even in their descriptions. They like uh, smelled it, but something was missing in poor conceptualization. And that's, again, what I think about your Vivek, your work. We were all, many of us, who are all bothered by the same problem. What's the deep shit we are in? What's wrong? Why action doesn't happen? We smelled it, knew it, but, you know, here I am a materialist Christian in the sense of the word is logos is not at the beginning, but at the end. At the beginning, it's a mess. Then somebody here, you did Vivek, has to say the word, has to clearly formulate it. And all of a sudden, even if you don't agree with everything, but you know the proper terrain is formulated. 
So first, let me begin by a self-critical remark for somebody who is perceived as Lacanian, psychoanalytic, Marxist, whatever. I think, and this was even my founding experience, if I may permit myself this new age term, that uh, uh, psychoanalysis was often unfortunately used in the Western Marxist tradition exactly in the way you, Vivek, described the reference to ideology. It was Marxist economic analysis is correct and so on, blah, blah, but there is no revolution, no collective organization. So not even ideology. They claimed, ah, psychoanalysis will give the answer. And then you evoke all the obscurity of, you know, death drive, perversion, and so ever, as if we will get the answer there. That's where, that's the temptation we should absolutely resist. And uh, let me give you an example. Allow me to make a couple of points. That's my first point of this, what you, Vivek, called the materialism. I think that uh, for me, the formative experience was not mine. I was happy to have a permanent state job, ac academic, but my experience with precarious workers, like it was in London, of all places, that a couple of times I, I don't like Uber, they exploit workers too much, but how does Uber exploit workers? In a way which, not as an ideal force up there, but in their very material experience of work, in some sense, it makes them feel free, not only free, but even small entrepreneurs of their own. Uh, an Uber guy told me, listen, it's wonderful. I, there is no capitalist exploitation. I, he even knew about Marxism. He says, you see, I own my own means of production, my car. So nobody is exploiting me. The company is just providing to me the general frame. And I work when I want to work in my conditions in this sense and so on and so on. And then I failed, but I engaged in a debate with a guy because I tried to tell him, but do you know to what extent like your long-term perspectives are uncertain? You don't have health care, security and all other stuff. And he was aware of it, but he said, and I am now doing pretty well. I don't care about that. And he wasn't stupid. I understood him. In a way, he lived relatively well. He said, if I want, I take a weekend off. I work when I want. Another thing, and here I come back to your point, Vivek, is that I told him, but are you aware that in, instead of experiencing your situation like we all Uber drivers against the company, Uber, their blah, blah, you're, you perceive your competitors as the other Uber drivers. You know, the very form of this Uber precarious work in its materiality, not in some complex uh, collective psychology level prevents uh, solidarity. Because again, it, in your material everyday life, your company, which is really reaping the profit, appears innocent. Oh, they're just organizing it. And the bad guys are your co-workers, precisely. So here I see a simple situation where without any big uh, deep psychology notions or whatever, you can see how, in this specific case, how the very material organization of 
precarious work in the sense of Uber driving prevent social solidarity and especially important since we live in an era where fetishism of choice is almost the main choice, you know, even if choices are vacuous. What are our choices, even in politics? Mostly they are like, you know, Pepsi Cola or Coca Cola and that type of stuff, you know. But, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the point is that uh, they make you experience, but again, in your concrete material life circumstances, they make you experience as a free agent, a small, entrepreneur of the self, because again, that's the big category of today's capitalism. Uh, the idea is, and again, I read it in a materialist way, in vivex sense. It's not something preached out. It's, that's the big. Can I just say one thing, uh, Slavoj, let me say one thing. Please. Uh, taking Uber as an example. My, my view, my general approach, which I think is the approach socialists used for more than a century, yeah. is that you start on the assumption that workers have a pretty good understanding of their working conditions. They're not fooled by it. They're not duped by it. So let's, let's yeah. look at Uber. Okay, Uber drivers are exploited in some way. They are part of the working class in some way. Uh, but then they have this feeling, as you said, that, look, I'm my own boss. Yeah, yeah. Now, is that a mistake? Well, it's not in the following way yeah, 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 yeah. that they are capturing accurately a dimension of their laboring experience because they are, in fact, in a labor process where they have a great deal of autonomy from managerial control compared to somebody in a Walmart or an Amazon warehouse or in a factory or in a fast food restaurant. Now, this has been true throughout the history of capitalism. Workers Uber drivers are sort of like owner operators or like farmers, independent farmers who um, sell their products to a marketing board or to a merchant who then exploits them through manipulating prices. If you asked a worker throughout the history of capitalism, we will give you a choice. You can work in a factory where there's an overseer bossing you around every minute of the day, or you can work at home or drive your own rickshaw or drive your own bicycle or drive your own taxi, you'll still be subject to some controls, but it'll be a different kind of control. Which of these two would you like? They have always preferred some degree of independent control, control over their own labor. So what's distinguishing the Uber driver from a factory worker is what we call the labor process, the facts about the labor process. And when he says to an intellectual, hey, I'm, I'm much more free here, a lot of intellectuals will then try to convince him that he's not. But he, in fact, is. He is driving the car, and he'd much rather be driving the car than being bent over a production line m manipulating physical objects. But those same Uber drivers today, in fact, are trying to organize. This is true across the capitalist world. There is a growing wave of organizing drive amongst Uber drivers, which means they are aware of the fact that they have some autonomy and they are aware of the fact that their bosses, Uber or whatever company it is, is taking a very large cut of the money that they're making and in fact is subjecting them to all sorts of other kinds of liabilities and injustices. So both facts are true. And there, there's nothing that the Uber drivers, that we're going to tell the Uber drivers as, I, as we are highfalutin intellectuals that they don't already know. Now, why is their organizing having experiencing such mixed success? It's for the reason Savoy says. They are workers, but they're atomized. They don't interact with other workers. They only see them for five minutes, 10 minutes. And in fact, they might even be competing with those workers in many ways, which is kind of true in capitalism generally. I mean, maybe you don't see them at all, right? There's not, exactly. there's not like a hall like there would be if you're a taxi cab driver. So when you do an analysis of Uber and you try to ask two questions, why has there been less organizing amongst Uber drivers than other kinds of workers? And then why is the organizing when it happens somewhat less successful? <laughs> It's all material and social factors. It's not ideology. The material and social factors are doing all the work of explaining it here. 
what the role of ideology is that they need to be able to generate a collective identity so that they can make their drive successful. But it's the material and social factors that explain why generating the identity is so difficult for the reasons you just said. They don't see each other. They compete with each other. They have all sorts of other constraints. So from an organizer, from a socialist standpoint, even something like Uber, the, the basic facts about their subordination and their organizing are all structurally explained. You don't have to resort to ideology to explain any of them. And their own perceptions are quite accurate. But Vivek, just really briefly on that, um, I mean, couldn't an organizer sometimes use shorthand like, hey, don't be a dope. Like the boss is really, you know, the the boss wants you to think that you're free. But really, like, look at it. How much do you get to determine? But like, the key point is this. When you say to him, the boss wants you to think you're free, but you're not. For your discourse, for your argument to be successful, you have to point to actual facts about their laboring conditions and their laboring experience, which means that you have to respect their knowledge. You cannot treat them as people who don't understand their circumstances. What you're doing is highlighting some circumstances over others. Now, but for the organizer, that means the first task is not to come out of your seminar or your party training and lecture to them about the nature of the proletariat. The first task is to learn the everyday quotidian ordinary aspects of their existence, which you don't yet know. But what are you doing when you try to learn those everyday aspects of their existence? You are admitting that it's their circumstances to which they're responding and not the wrong-headed conceptions in their heads. And until you understand those circumstances, you can't organize them, which is a tacit acceptance that it is their location and the structure and the facts about the structure that explain why they're doing what they're doing and not simply phantoms in their head. I, if I mean, I deeply agree with what Vivek, you said, you know, in what level. I think that although we were all trained by them, learned a lot from them, from Western Marxists, but especially in their extreme forms, like he's not always bad, but some of the texts by Marcuse, some speculations by Adorno and Horkheimer, you know, it's really behind it a kind of almost paranoiac theory of total manipulation. Ordinary people are totally manipulated and so on and so on. So they paint a picture which is in a way self-defeating. They paint a picture from which it is already clear that nothing can happen. And I don't have time to develop this, but this is a sense in which I think much of today's this predominant liberal left critical thought almost, I will be now cynical myself, uh, enjoys its defeat, enjoys painting the situation as the one of total manipulation where we cannot win and so on and so on. But let's not lose time on this. I want to go to another point which seems to me crucial. The way you, Vivek, turned around this notion of ideology. Yes, you know what's the strategy of, I don't use this term in paranoiac way, of those in power. Uh, the moment workers try to organize, okay, if I were to be official ideologist, I try to use this term in a non-paranoiac way, or propagator, uh, and you read this all the time, and Uber drivers try to organize themselves, I would tell them, but no, we live in a post-ideological world, you are anachronistic, you know, it's the... Uh, the ruling discourse, and again, I agree with you, Vivek, this is not a couple of big guys paid by I don't know whom, but this is their experience that if you mention trade unions and so on, no, you are talking about the old industrial capitalism, we live in a different world, and so on and so on. So how the category of anachronism is uh, is uh, crucial here. Next thing, I 
this is not now I come to I don't think we have a disagreement here. I will try to be uh, still a materialist, but, uh, but I would say this, the, the line of reasoning, which is present by some disappointed Marxists, I wonder, Vivek, if you would also reject it like I do, is my, now I've, I have problems with him, ultra Maoist Alain Badiou, you know what is very brutally his answer to revolutionary non-activity of the working class in Western countries? In a kind of a brutal Leninist Maoist way, he says, yes, they are all from, uh, from the global perspective of the entire world, all of the Western Europe and United States is already a uh, workers' aristocracy. They are already bribed, so we should simply discount them. They are no longer, and then they are involved into this. It's the worst thing. This uh, eternal, I remember it from my youth, I must be older than you, Vivek, how in 68, you know, the big problem was, yes, revolution, but who will be the subject? They, in their idealist way, wrote off the actual working class. Yeah. So then there was this search, eternal romanticizing temptation, either students, the idea was students are the truly exploited, then, and I never liked it. Did you notice how even today, the Western left is desperately searching for an idealized third world country where it's the real thing. Uh, now the thing is not, it used to be, uh, Slavoj, it was the peasantry under the influence of Maoism. The peasants were supposed to, yes. now it's the indigenous. Yeah, yeah. Intelligent colonizers always knew how to incorporate indigenous elements to make the, their system of colonization stable. For example, I know maybe you also do a little bit of, a little bit, very little bit of situation in India where, you know, there is one of the most terrifying books that I know, The Loss of Manu, I think, a systematic yeah. description of, of uh, uh, everything, even, you know, how do you make love, I love this. I love it. There, there's a very good section on how to take a shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They and need to know them too. A, a part there on, you know, after, after ejaculation, in what way do you wipe your penis, whatever, whatever. But you know what I learned then through my Indian friends? In the uh, 17th, 18th century, this book was half forgotten. The British colonizers resuscitated it because they got it that it's much better for the exploitation. Not, not that formula, I never liked it, that under capitalism, they all colonizers wanted us to imitate them. No, there is also a very strong uh, colonialist uh, uh, multiculturalism, not in the authentic sense, but in, in the sense of le let, let, them have, uh, let them have their own uh, culture. Slova, I want to go back to what you said about Badiou, because it's very important. Uh, I don't want that point to get lost, because yeah. it's a very yeah. widely held notion among the white left in Europe and the United States, and some sections now of the left coming out of minorities that the working class has been bought off in the West and that it's too, um, its standards of living are too high or that it's living on the fruits of imperialism and therefore it cannot be a political agent. And it's a profoundly uh, idiotic notion because on the one hand is completely unaware of the recent history of the West. And secondly, it has a ridiculous under theory of imperialism, which is also completely false. Now, I, for a second, I want to set aside the issue of the theory of imperialism, 
let, let's just focus on the empirical descriptive claim they're making that the working class has been bought off or is, is too well off. These theories are promulgated, as you said, in 68, the generation of 68, that new left. Let's just examine 68 for a second. What happened in 68? 68 was the last great wave of strikes and labor uprisings in the West. Exactly at the moment that the student left is writing off the Western working class, the Western working class went into the largest wave of strikes we had seen since the 1940s. That was in the midst of the highest wages that the working class had had in the 20th century. So first of all, the idea that wage levels, rising wages make workers conservative was blown to bits right there, right in 1968, because their wages were so, so high. Secondly, the idea that the working class is therefore too well off to do anything is also blown to bits right there in 1968. Yeah. The, the question for us is why? And I address this in my book a little bit. Why, when wages are so high, did workers organize in 68 and go into strike activity? It's because the material well-being of workers includes many things other than just wages. What was happening in the late 60s in the United States and Europe? Wages had gone up, but so had work intensification. So had the level of injuries. Work days were getting longer and longer. Unions were no longer responding. That's why so many of these strikes are what we called wildcat strikes. They were strikes that the unions had not authorized. Workers were angry, not at their bo- just at their bosses, but also at the unions and, were ang- and wanted to disrupt the unions. All of this happens in 1968 in the middle of the greatest prosperity that capitalism has ever seen and in the middle of rising standards of living if you just measure them through wages. Even at that moment, this theory was blown to bits. But now let's well, look what happened. Look what's happened in the past 30 years. The notion that the white working class has been living high on the hog or has been ha- having this incredibly lavish lifestyle since the 1980s is for the left to advance such ideas is disgraceful. Not only have standards of living been stagnating, not only has the Uh, workplace conditions been getting worse. Not only has there been more and more speed up, for the first time in a century, the white working class in the United States has found its life expectancy shortening. For the first time, with all the medical advances, with all this glorious, somehow, this supposed increase in standard of living, they are dying faster than they did 10 years ago. They're in the middle of an opioid crisis where they are the level of death in this country from opium overdoses, from drug overdoses. And there's a reason why Angus Deaton calls it deaths of despair. It's coming from, on the one hand, a steady deterioration in their standards of living. And on the other, a conviction that nobody cares. Nobody gives a shit. The political parties don't care. The intelligentsia doesn't care. The media doesn't care. In fact, they're told if they're, you're white and you're poor, you must be the biggest loser in the world because all of the imperial profits in the world come to you and you're still poor. It's all your fault. This is the reality that they face. And this is what I think finally the left is. You're right. There are a lot of sections of the left that still prefer a dark skinned person in a hula dress as their universal subject. They still prefer that because it's exotic. But finally, there is, I think, in the United States and in some parts of Europe, a realization that white people can also be exploited (laughs) and that the struggle for justice isn't a tribal struggle between different colored people. It's a struggle between classes. And there's multicolored people on top and multicolored ones on the bottom. This is coming around. But this view that you described accurately is repellent, this notion that the entire, the majority of the Western European population can be written off because they don't abide by some mistaken picture that the left has in its head. That left does more damage than it does good. Um, I wanted to ask, like, you know, sort of along these lines, Vivek, what you're saying is, you know, your book, I think, does a really good job at giving sort of the, the negative case of why, especially when we're thinking about working people's organizing, um, there are so many obstacles that are bound up with the class structure itself that, you know, we can think very, it doesn't require a big, as as Slavoj also said, a big complex ideological theory, big complex psychological theory. I'm curious, though, about, you know, 
I mean, it's interesting to write this kind of book at this time, say, in the United States context, because there are some like genuinely crazy things that people seem to believe, like, for instance, that the 2020 election was stolen or and and there is, you know, around figures like an intense um, seeming adherence to personalities on the right, etc., that relatively neglected, exploited people, like some of the people you're describing, um, are often beholden to. And obviously, there's a long history of thinking about, you know, ideology is helping to explain kind of the seeming irrationalism in the history of ideology, theory of ideology about racism. And then, you know, today in thinking about, well, why do people believe, you know, some people believe vaccines have chips in them or whatever. So I'm just curious, like, what you think about... Look, I, the, the view that I hold is not that ideology does not exist or that people's people don't misunderstand things about the world or they, they're not misinformed. The view that I hold is quite simple, which is that the more you ask questions about people's immediate experiences, yeah. the less they're going to be fooled by ideology. So if you're, if for socialists, the first order of business was always organizing workers against their bosses, organizing workers at the workplace around their interests. Now on those issues, what are my basic interests with regard to my job conditions, my wages, the speed of work, what I need outside the workplace, I need as a working person. On those issues, you should expect workers aren't fooled. They have a pretty good understanding of what their interests are. But the more you move outside their direct experience and ask them their judgments about matters for which they need access, not to their direct experience, phenomenological experience, but to information. An example, economic policy. If you ask a worker, what are your basic needs, your economic needs, they're going to be pretty accurate in what they tell you. Pretty accurate as in you have no reason to misjudge what they're saying because they experience it every day. They know that if I don't have a good enough wage, I can't buy food. They know that if I don't have some sort of limit to the working day, I'm working myself to death. They know that if I don't have some sort of childcare, we have very difficult decisions in our family about who's going to stay at home and take care of the child. They know these things. They will have a pretty good understanding of them. Now you ask them, what kinds of economic policies can make it better on these very dimensions for you? What policies will help you hold on to your job? What policies will help you um, have rising higher wages? What are they supposed to tell you? On that, they have no direct experience. They have to rely on the views of experts. Now ask them, what kinds of policies, do, what, what do you think went down in this election? Do you think it was a fair election? Were the votes counted fairly? They don't know. For these sorts of things, the last two policies, what happened in election, they have to rely on information that other parties are giving them. And that information can be manipulated. Now, in the United States, why, are, why, do, they, why do so many working class people believe that the election was stolen when it clearly was not. I think it's not that hard to understand. First of all, they believe the system is rigged top to bottom. They believe everybody on both sides of the political spectrum is corrupt in the political establishment. They also believe that nothing is beyond these people. They believe that if they can, they'll take everything away from me because they've been taking it away for the last 40 years. And they also understand that they are powerless to stop it. They're completely cynical about the system. They believe it built, it's been captured by the elites. They believe the elites will do anything to hold on to it. And now along comes Trump, somebody who they believe is contemptuous, which he is, of the system because he's a sociopath. And they, he says to them, look, this party stole. And why would they believe Trump? Two reasons. The party's been screwing them over for 40 years. The party's candidates openly tell them that there's nothing we can do. When Clinton and his, his Hillary, when Bill and Hillary Clinton passed NAFTA and in the aftermath of NAFTA, when people's lives were devastated, what did the Democratic Party tell them? Free trade, man. Free trade is like the laws of gravity. There's nothing you can do. You lost your job? Tough shit. Suck it up. Go find a better job. This is their party telling them this. Now they're told that that same party has stolen the election. Yeah. There is a chunk of them that will believe it because they're utterly cynical about the system. And what did I say in my book? For the working class, 
when it finds that it has no power in its class position, its go-to ideology, its natural ideology is cynicism and a belief that the entire system is corrupt because in fact, that's how you rationalize what's happening to you. Now, when you already disposed to believing that the system is corrupt, of course, you're easy to manipulate on matters, but that, that you don't directly experience every day. You're because you're dependent on information. I don't think it's a mystery at all, to be honest. I, I really don't. I think it's astounding that the left thinks that theories of false consciousness are to be tested when in the electoral arena. Elections are the most complicated thing on earth. It's a very uh, complex mix of emotions, rationality, and teasing all those things out is extremely difficult. The, where, the place you go if you really want to see if people are cognitively deficient, if they don't understand themselves, is in matters that they directly experience every day. And on those matters, you ask for 40 years, Americans have been asked, what's the most important thing for you in your life? They always give the same answer, economic issues. It's always the same answer, economic issues. Now they're asked, what should we do about them? And they're, then they're all over the place because they, at that moment, they reach for information, external information, and they have no source. There are every single avenue of information in America is a bourgeois institution. Every single one. What do you expect these people? They, they're supposed to spontaneously have a, a trade policy, <laughs> spontaneously have political. This is just nonsense. It's from an intelligentsia that despises the poor. You hold your standards up high and you go, if you don't meet these standards, you're irrational. You have false, it's just nonsense. I, I cannot agree more than I do with you, Vivek. Why? Let me first, just a couple of short, I hope, short notes. First, 68. Did you notice, I noticed, because I'm old enough, blah, blah, I was there, how some commentator put this nicely. The way we remember today 60s is basically not 60s, but 70s. Because <laughs> when the system stabilized itself, all the social components in France, you remember the highest moment students joining striking workers from a Renault factory and so on, all that disappears and 60s remain orgies, sexual freedom, free use of drugs, and so on and so on. It's incredible how we uh, falsely reinvented the 60s. Next point. I think it's very important, Vivek, what you mentioned. It's not just, uh, it's not just uh, 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 in the uh, quantitatively determined standard of living, how much you earn, it's uh, one factor which concerns very much daily experience, which is, as you pointed out, this intensity, hyperactivity, and so on and so on. And would you agree? That's my question to you, Vivek. Uh, we, would you agree about two points? First, that one, paradoxically, of the reasons of the stability of the system it's precisely it's hyperactivity. It's not that you don't do anything. You have to survive today. You have to be hyperactive all the time. And precisely this hyperactivity doesn't give you not even a chance to withdraw. But more important, now I come to my topic. Uh, it's crucial what you said about this. People don't believe in cynical distance and so on. Would you agree or am I going a little bit too far? But I tend to believe myself here that uh, cynicism today, it's not a failure of ideology. It's the most popular, almost common everyday ideology. And as such, I don't think it really bothers the system. Uh, it's almost, I would say, in the interest of the capitalist system that people don't take seriously how to, uh, how to uh, get politically organized and so on. What the regime prefers is something like politics always gets corrupted. You will always be screwed up. Just stick to your private interest. So we have this paradox that maybe the predominant mode of 
I still call it ideology, is this cynical distance towards everything. So let me, let me take up both points. Yeah. Uh, I very much agree with both of them. And let me um, rephrase what you said. Uh, as regards the first point, which is what you call hyperactivity. Uh, I think this is a absolutely natural and pervasive consequence of neoliberalism. Now, by this hyperactivity, what are we really talking about? What we're talking about is in the last 40 years, all of the protective institutions that the working class had built up from the 19 teens, trade unions, social safety nets, medical care, child care, neighborhood associations, social gatherings of any kind have all been torn apart. Productivity has been stagnant. Wages have been stagnant. Precarity has become now pervasive. So what do workers do? They are constantly on the treadmill trying somehow to survive. The hyperactivity, Slavoj, that you're talking about is the hyperactivity of somebody trying not to sink when they've been thrown in the water. They're just working their asses off. They're, they're terrified. They don't, have, they don't know what old age is going to bring them. They don't know what will happen if they fall sick. The biggest cause of bankruptcies in the United States today is when somebody falls sick. How barbaric is a system where if you fall ill, you lose everything you have? So the hyperactivity is a material hyperactivity when you shut off everything else in your universe and you just look at getting through the day. And there is no better way of stabilizing the system than to turn people into hamsters who are just on a, this, this roller thing, constantly working, constantly just trying to stay alive. Your second point about cynicism flows directly from this. The cynicism, you're 100% right. It's, you can call it ideology, and I do. It's, an, it's a rationalization. But what is cynicism really? Cynicism is the belief that nothing can be changed. Now, it is a natural and accurate understanding of the reality around them when they are atomized, when they don't have political parties, when they don't have institutions. Of course, they'll become cynical because it's the only way they can make sense of the lives that they're living. When they have no choice in any important decision in their lives, the natural response to say is this is just a fact of nature and I will never be able to change it. Now, your point was doesn't doesn't this serve the ruling class? Of course, because when you're cynical, what's your natural next step is to opt out, is to give up, is to not try to change anything. No, Chomsky said this a very long time ago. He said the genius of the American system is this. It doesn't try to take away your rights. It just makes it not only impossible, but also to you, it seems pointless to try to exercise those rights. You don't need authoritarianism in America. Half the population already doesn't vote. You don't need to make people scared of changing something because they already believe they can't change anything. That is a natural response to cynicism. And it is astounding to see self-styled progressive and liberals now come and heap shit on these people because they're cynical about the system, because they're not organizing, because they'll be easily manipulated, because they feel that the election is stolen election is stolen. Trump didn't invent this. Hillary Clinton did. For four years, she said she won the election, but the Russians stole it. Four years. And it's supposed to be Trump, who is the, is the stolen election dude. Both parties are doing this. Both parties are slowly encroaching on the democratic space. And as long as the left continues to heap opprobrium and criticism towards the majority of the population, because they're too white, too male, too hetero, this and that or the other, it just tells you it's not a left. It is a section of the middle class that has found a way to express its contempt for working people, contempt for the working class, either through writing them off or through the exoticism. Why are they exotic? I'll tell you why. Because you can't go to Bolivia and organize these indigenous. You could just watch movies about them and talk about it. So look at your life. You are now a revolutionary socialist who has written off the working class and who thinks the revolutionary agent is somebody who you'll never actually be able to see in your life. What's the, what's the result? Yeah, very convenient. I never have to do anything. I can simply watch black and white documentaries about the sexual mores of Bolivian peasants and talk shit about the working class as being white supremacist. Yeah, that's your left. I mean, I totally think agree. One other can I, question. Sorry, please, please. Uh, so one other question, I think like, um, 
I think that is right. And I think there's, you know, a kind of call in this book to organize, to for the left to think of themselves as organizers rather than as sort of contemplative outsiders looking at the irrationality of the social scene and sort of being, you know, whatever, eating your popcorn while the world collapses. Um, I think one question I have, I guess, for both of you, really, because, you know, Slavoj, you're in, in many ways, I think you're of like your life's work is like ideology critique. And so I'm wondering, you know, the call for leftists to take organizing seriously, to think about interests. Is there a place, what place does ideology critique have in that? Um, is there a future for ideology critique and also for the more kind of constructive project of ideology, sort of socialist ideology construction that Vivek, you point to? I'm curious about both of your thoughts on that. Let me take this one. Very uh, please. Vivek, you, if you want, go on. I think there's this ideology critique is, in fact, central for the left, even though I think that the world runs on material interests. So how is it central? Well, there are two ways, one obvious and one perhaps not so obvious to today's left. One way in which it's central is that even though workers make their choices based on material considerations, they rationalize those choices through an ideological apparatus. And oftentimes when you encounter workers, you will find them steeped in what you regard to be ideology because they have to live with their lives. Some of that ideology will be eh, harmless cynicism. Some of it will be quite pernicious. So for example, the racism that one sees in, in a lot of American workers is a way of dealing with their own insecurity. There's this ridiculous concept that left academics like to work with called racial resentment, which means that white workers are angry at their racist because they resent the fact that blacks have better lives, which is really absurd. And someday in Catalyst, we need to have an article on this because the very same data that seems to show racial resentment is actually showing racial anxiety. And that's two very different things. It's one thing to be anxious about your jobs and not want a Mexican to take it over. It's quite another to say, why does this Mexican lead a decent life? I resent him for doing so. Resentment is the wrong term. But you will find racism, you will find a lot of misogyny, and you have to now try to get workers to come out of it. They will not come out of it if you simply wag your finger at them. They will come out of it if you talk to them about why they hold these notions, and if you explain to them everything they have to gain by ditching those notions. So you get out of ideology through organizing around people's material interests, not by shaming them, not by dismissing them. You encounter workers typically in some way or form steeped in ideology. So all organizing starts as ideological critique. The point of my book is the ideological critique cannot work unless it's anchored in an understanding of people's actual interests. And they'll tell you what those interests are. You don't have to go tell them. They already understand them. That's point number one. Point number two is this. A lot of the work of ideological critique has to do with undoing the damage of the intelligentsia. The problem, if you really want to find ideology, don't look to workers, look to intellectuals. Nobody believes bullshit ideology and bullshit ideas more than intellectuals do. So some of what we're doing on the left today, why do I write a book like The Class Matrix? It's not, no worker's gonna read it, very few are. It's designed to show that the real problem right now is the left intellectuals and the garbage theories that they've been propagating. So much, you look at the organization you're in, Jeremy, the DSA, it's filled with garbage. It's filled with virtue signaling. It's filled with notions, this pandering to identity politics, all of which is middle-class politics. A lot of what the work inside political organizations right now has to be ideological critique, not of workers, but of the middle class that claims to be on the left. Much of what Marx did, what was the capital is a critique of political economy, he is not only trying to develop political economy, he's also critiquing political economy that he has received from the classical tradition as being steeped in ideology. So we do ideology critique in two ways. One is as organizers, you critique the everyday spontaneous ideological rationalizations that workers have. That's the easy part. The harder part is if you're circulating among intellectuals to try to get parts of the intelligentsia to see the ideology in their work and in their colleagues' work. Because unlike workers who have a material interest in ditching nonsensical notions, 
Intellectuals do not. And today's intelligentsia has a material interest in propagating bullshit. That's the heart. Now, why should you do that? Because the fact is a lot of the left today is in middle class circles, in universities, in academia. And you're going to those who are well-intentioned, those who want to do good are misled by what we would call ideology, which is these forms of liberal identitarianism, virtue signaling, genuflecting in various ways. And one has to try to equip them with an, a, a better understanding of capitalism and hopefully motivate them to do real politics and not this symbolic cosplay politics that so much of the left does. That's all I have to say. I just want to add something because I, again, something is missing here. At the end, somebody should pull out a knife because we are just agreeing with each other. I like this. Then one point. I see not a hope. It's a very dangerous phenomenon, but we should build on it. Maybe this is more typically European. I followed through my friends and so on. Something specific about, and they are not always the good guys, uh, this new type of social protests in Western Europe, like Gilets Jeunes, Yellow Vests in France, Podemos in Spain, and so on. This is a discontent, but which is not, so it's not cynicism, passivity. They want to do something. But it's obvious that they cannot articulate themselves in the existing options of the political space. The moment Podemos did this, they are now a very modest uh, social democratic, very modest social democratic party. And that's one argument often listed that I like to mention again and again, how, you know, when in America they were saying Bernie Sanders, crazy socialist. If you compare Bernie Sanders' most radical statements by let us say Swedish, I don't idealize them, but around the Swedish social democracy program in the 60s, they are ultra more radical and so on. But the point I want to make is that this movement and in, uh, with yellow shirts protesting in France, it's even more ambiguous. You cannot clearly identify them. Uh, I mean, they, they, you have even elements of anti-immigrant racism, a little bit, but, but it is a genuine discontent which cannot be translated into existing political space. You know where I experienced this at its purest? Once in the middle of, or towards the end of Tony Blair's reign in the UK, I was in London and I watched a week before elections, general elections, some big uh, popular tens of thousands of people participating, opinion poll, who is the most hated person in the UK? Tony Blair won. A week later, there were elections, Tony Blair won. So obviously, there is some discontent here, very dangerous one, which maybe gives some hope. The second thing about cynicism of this pseudo-radical liberal middle class left. You know what is, now I will not go into theory, but a very personal experience. That's why I hate that. A friend asked me, are you against death penalty? Uh, my answer was, yes, I am. But after we shoot some of the people who deserve it, and among them, the aesthetic, this great art, Biennales. They are art at its purest, totally immersed into capitalism, but their ideology, their introduction, it has to be anti-Eurocentric. They even include awareness of it, how we know we are totally manipulated by, but as such, they fit perfectly into it. So I totally agree with you. Yes, Stalinist purges, sorry, not literally. And, uh, next, my final point, where would you agree or not? But I, uh, not that I try to save traditional critique of ideology, but you know, the part 
which I often emphasize, and I would really like to conclude your direct possible critical opinion, is that what I find so fascinating in Marx is that in Capital, when he, where he uh, analyzes, not ideology in this abstract sense, but actual life experience, ideas, presuppositions, which are part of material reality, he speaks about things like commodity fetishism, which interestingly enough, he doesn't dare to call, he never calls it ideology. Right. But it is an illusion, which is not ideology in the sense that elaborated by professors, priests, whatever, it's part of your daily experience. Yeah. And I think we should, even with when ordinary people, and by this I mean us also, when we are confused, don't think ideology in the sense of all the books behind. Think about illusions that you follow in your daily life, even if you, in your full awareness, would say, of course, I don't believe it. If you uh, allow me to conclude with the joke, which is my favorite joke on ideology today, which I used, I would say, about 40, 50 times in my work or whatever, but it's perfect. Niels Bohr, the great guy, Copenhagen. You know the story, you must know it. He was visited by a friend in his country house where he saw a horseshoe above the entrance to the house. And the friend, another scientist, asked him, but you are a scientist. This is superstition. In Europe, this means uh, a horseshoe above the entrance prevents the entrance, prevents evil spirits to enter the house. And Niels Bohr gave a perfect answer. He says, of course, I'm a scientist. I don't believe in it. But I have it there because I was told that it works even if you don't believe in it. <laughs> That's how cynicism today works. You don't have to believe in it. Look, that would be my lesson to ordinary people, among whom I include myself, especially university professors, workers, and so on. Isn't it that often? My last question to you, Vivek. I, I found a passage in, uh, otherwise he's often too liberal for me, but nonetheless a nice one, in uh, George Orwell, the early Orwell for 37, when he noticed at that point already that many progressive intellectuals, they see injustice in the world, they protest against it, but that if you look closely at it, they are hyperactive, but you can feel like, let's talk all the time about change to make sure that nothing will really change. You know, you know yeah. that's yeah. the horror that I feel with many today's critical theory intellectuals. They, think, they yeah. talk about change, but the moment change comes close, they withdraw, and there is Another a thing which I especially hate is pseudo-opportunist radicalism. Whenever there is a chance of maybe a small change, like Bernie Sanders, I don't idealize him. But, uh, you know, I have many disagreements with AOC, the beautiful one. But she said something wonderful when Bernie was attacked by some feminists. She said, in your spirit, Vivek, I think, she said, he is so precious to us precisely because he is an old white man. Yeah. Such people can also be for us. And, okay, some of my radical friends said, no, he is just an old social democrat. This is not yet the true revolution, and so on and so on. I, what I almost absolutely hate today, even more than cynicism, which is, as you pointed out, Vivek, our everyday experience, understandable, is uh, this, uh, how do I call it, uh, principled opportunism. You wait for some true, authentic revolution, which means 
whenever some movement really begins, you say, oh, this is still in bourgeois limits, it means nothing, and so on and so on. That's what really horrifies me. Yeah, I, look, let me pick up on a couple of points, uh, Slavoj, because I, I, I agreed with everything you said. We, we are both now talking about ideology critique within the intelligentsia and within the middle class. That's what we're talking about. And what you find it in two different ways. One is their interests coming out in the narrowing of what the ambitions are for social change. And fundamentally, this is narrowing it so that social change becomes upward mobility for the middle class. So what we call identity politics today is not any longer anti-oppression politics. It's not changing the lives of working class black people or working class women. It is increasing the chances for mobility for black professionals, black politicians, black business people, and for women, exactly the same, women professionals, women politicians, etc. So racism is now something that inhabits the top echelons. What in, in, it's astounding. There, here's Bernie Sanders talking about making community colleges free for everybody. But in New York City, the debates around education are about why there aren't more black students in the most selective high school in the city. In universities, the debate is why Harvard, Yale, Princeton don't have a more diverse student body, not about why schools for black working class people are crumbling. So this move, so-called movement for racial justice is actually a movement for upward mobility of elites within these, these sections of the population. That's counter to social change, but it in fact is simply a naked expression of class interests. Now let's talk about the cynicism that you're talking about. The, the other way in which you see, so this is one way I call it simply contempt for the poor. What today's identitarianism is a contempt for working class black people and working class women by their own elites. It's just like nationalism has been throughout the history of the world. Nationalism was always captured by elites and then turned into a program for their own upward advancement. Now, let's look at this ultra leftism. Well, why is nothing good enough for you if you're an ultra leftist? Because it, it absolves you of the responsibility of trying to do anything. You're still waiting. You're waiting for that perfect moment, that perfect movement, that perfect upheaval. And, so, and th this is exactly what the exoticism is. Why is the exoticism so appealing to so much of the Western left? Because it's a faraway land. It's all occurring someplace, somewhere that you'll never have to be, never have to go. And now you can commodify it. You can aestheticize it. You can talk about it all you want, but at no cost to yourself, no sacrifice to yourself. It's no surprise that a lot of this uh, aestheticized, exoticized discourse is also incom incomprehensible. It's impenetrable. Because when you're saying things, that, as you saw in my book, Slavoj, the Orientalism, when I'm a critique of, of post-colonial theory, yeah. why is post-colonial theory impossible to understand? It's because they're racist. It's because if they openly say, dark people can't do math, brown people don't understand their interests, it'll sound a lot like 19th century colonialists. So they have to couch it in an impenetrable language to give it the appearance of profundity, whereas in fact it's garden variety racism. So we are in an intelligentsia right now that not only has given up on trying to change the lives of the vast majority, it never had any interest in it. The left, if it's going to come about again, will have to be a left that recaptures the spirit of humility, sacrifice, clarity, and ambition. That it's not enough to open up some spaces for upward mobility for minority elites. The project is about changing the lives of the vast majority, which means taking on those very elites that are trumpeting these tiny little eddies right now of social progress, what they call social progress. I think we're only at the very earliest stages of that. I think the left from the days of Lenin has basically died and in its wake has left a great deal of quite destructive cultural, intellectual and political baggage. I think we are now going to have to rediscover as the left 
in the late 19th century did, that the way to social progress is through and with working people, not around them. And it's our responsibility to make ourselves relevant to them, not their responsibility to make themselves appealing to us. Can I add an important conclusion? Sorry. Just direct to the uh, but you, this was crucial for me when you said, yes, uh, uh, everyday experience of ordinary people, but at a certain point, economic politics and so on, they need experts. And what I liked so much, whenever, and even through my obscenities, I can, it's easy for me to find link. I'm not patronizing them, I'm dirtier than them, with the so-called ordinary people. But you know what I always respected from them? They have all so-called, sorry for to use the term, ordinary people were immensely sensitive to, patro- for high intellectuals to patronize them in the way which appears egalitarian. I was told by Terry Eagleton that one big British historian, that's the lesson for me, uh, in the 70s, late 60s, wanted to do, it was fashionable there. He went, I don't think it was Eric Hobsbawm, maybe it was him, I'm not sure. He went to a big factory and gave a speech to workers. And he began with this falsely solidary egalitarian view. He said, I'm here to learn from you. I don't know anything more than you. And then something sublime happened. An ordinary worker interrupted him and told him, sorry, no, you are paid to know things that you cannot know. You are here to teach us. Don't give us bullshit that you don't know more than us and so on and so on. You see, there is also this false solidarity yeah. of the left. And uh, Vivek, maybe this is my own, own example that will maybe amuse you. Another of my sublime experiences, I repeat it all the time, sorry, was when I was decades ago in Missoula, Montana. And I met some, how do you call them now officially, Native Americans. And then I met some actual Native Americans there. Of course, through exchange of obscenities, I we immediately became friends. And then uh, uh, I used the term Indians, and immediately there was a politically correct white liberal who interrupted me. No, this is racist. They are Native Americans. And you know what my, whatever you call it, Native American Indian friend did I fell in love with him. He said to the white liberal, first, please allow us to call ourselves the way we want. He said, I don't like to be called Native American because, sorry, the opposite of nature is is culture. What are you, cultural Americans? (laughs) And then he finished with something beautiful. Maybe you know the joke, I'm sorry. He said, I much prefer to be called Indian because at least my name is then uh, a sign of your white man's stupidity who thought you were in India <laughs> when you came here. So, so they have, I admire this with my black friends, my Native American Indian, whatever friends, how sensitive they are to the falsity of this white liberal patronizing respect for their identity and so on. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Before we close, is there anything you two disagree about? (laughs) You know, it looks very bad. When the two people are so close as we are, I think it looks very bad. I really enjoyed it so much, thanks very much, and I hope it's not the last time. I I've, I'm, I very much appreciate your taking the time, Slavoj. It's the first time we got to I will try to make a jump over to to New York if Good. everything okay. will not go wrong. Who knows? Maybe the universal uh, uh, money will already be rubles at that point. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I will come there and uh, NYU 
uh, 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 NYU, Washington Square. That's my territory. So Fantastic. we can meet there. I Fantastic. Hope. I look yeah. forward. To Thank it. you. Thank you really Thanks. both. Thank Very you to much. Vivek. Thank you to Zizek. I love the rhyme. I forgot to mention, but um, uh, I immediately <laughs> noticed it. And you know what's the nicest thing? My is Zizek Vivek. It's yeah. not Zizek or what, so it rhymes even more than it may appear. Yeah. So thank you to you both. Uh, thanks to our audience for watching. Um, please hit like, subscribe, and share the channel, Jacobin Channel, with your friends. And uh, again, uh, Vivek and see it. I can't even pronounce the names now. <laughs> Vivek and Slavoj, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye bye. If you like this video from the Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks. Thank you.